Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is uh, Deanna Yerichuk. I um, uh, live in Canada on the Haldeman Tract, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral people. Um, it's about 100 kilometers southwest of Toronto. It's a real deep pleasure for me to be here at SIM. Uh, welcome to everyone in the room, and to those of you that are tuning online, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Um, we're very pleased to have you with us here this morning. This is an incredible uh, group of papers and people. It's what Bridie described as a brain trust, and I think it's going to be a really wonderful uh, session. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's all. Uh, what, what's interesting to me as, a, as an outsider, as a Canadian, all of the research and the work happens here in Australia, and, and so I hope that my outsider offers a fresh perspective and not so much of an ignorant perspective. But there might be times where I might ask questions that I, where I, I don't understand what's happening, and I hope that you will correct me or, um, or, or explain that a little more. Maybe, maybe that will be helpful in terms of expanding what, what us international folks can understand from, from the context here. I'm very excited. So uh, with that said, I would like to introduce our first speakers today. Um, the full uh, panel is Naomi Sunderland, Christy Apps, Ping Zhang, Brigitte Scarf, and Darren Garvey. Um, that I believe Naomi and Christy will be presenting. The paper called Examining Immediate and Long-Term Effects of First Nations Live Music Performance on Audiences and Known Health De Determinants. Over to you. Thank you very much. This is my first sim, and hopefully it's the first of many. I'm having such an awesome time, and it's so lovely to be here and, and hear all the amazing work that's getting done and and um, think and collaborate with you all. So it's been a real pleasure. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turubal people as the um, traditional custodians of the land that we meet today. Um, pay my respects uh, to elders, past, present and emerging, um, and, and recognise Uncle Kev Starkey, who we have online, um, as, an, as an amazing contributor to the... To the um, Remedy Project um, and acknowledge the strength and resilience and uh, the connection to country um, and care um, that First Nations people all, all over the world have, uh, have um, two lands and waterways and acknowledge uh, First Nations song people as the first songwriters and music makers in these lands we call Australia. Uh, so, in the Remedy Project, we have a little, um, uh, a little, a little mantra um, that we 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 say there's no talk or no yarning before music. So, before I go into our uh, presentation, I'm just going to play you a little a little chorus of a song that I wrote. And one of the amazing things that is happening. Um, and I've just, it's just been such a, an awesome experience to be part of, is making sense of the, the data that we're collecting and people's yarns and stories through music and art um, and poetry. And this is a song that I wrote um, from some yarns, a yarn with a non-Indigenous music facilitator in Mbantua, um, Alice Springs. And her recollection of what um, rich uh, music um, industry and music activity is happening in Mbantua. And um, a phrase that she used is um, to be part of the music programs and just to be involved in the community. She talked about that they're growing up gently, that things take time and just having spaces for people to um, to play music and be together um, is is uh, really beautiful, but a process that um, it just takes that time to nurture that that relationships and um, for everyone involved. So I thought that line "growing up gently" was just beautiful and really reminded me of how it how my time in in Bantua felt when we were doing data um, collection and just getting to know the community there. So I'm going to mention the Desert Divas and Bush Bands and the Big Sing, which are three amazing programs or activities that are happening. 
growing up gently round here. We're growing up gently round here. The bush bands are blazing, the divas are amazing, and the big sing brings me to tears. So now we're going uh, we're going to start the, the presentation. I've taken up a bit of time, but that's that's our rule. No 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 yarning before music. I'm going to come down here. Oh yeah. Oh maybe I'll stay up here. No. <laughs> so um, a little bit about me. I'm a I'm a uh, the research assistant on the Remedy Project. I grew up on the lands of the Kwandamooka people in Moreton Bay in Wellington Point. I'm a queer cisgendered uh, musician, social worker, researcher, um, and um, music lover. So uh, that's sort of me in a nutshell. Um, so when we were in, well, a part of the Remedy Project is the, an audience survey that we conducted in Mbantwa around uh, two big music festivals that happened there, the Desert Song and the Desert um, Festival, and uh, another event that was happening with our community partner called um, Children's Ground. So it was a, an, an event um, that they were facilitating. So I've talked a little bit about that. This is a bit of demographics, which, oh, it's not. Oh, sorry, I've got to do this. There we go. Um, so that's the p participants that were, and the different festivals where people were at. Uh, predominantly women, almost half men, um, and uh, a couple of non-binary folk, and, and a couple that preferred not to say. There is a big, um, in, in Imbantua, which is sort of something that I found out from being up there, but it's, the, it's sort of known as a, a queer capital of Australia, so, which is awesome. And, and hopefully, um, and I think there was a lot of local people coming to, this, um, to these events, but also a lot of people from out of town that were coming to these events, but quite a high proportion of the people that did the sur survey were um, LGBTIQ+. Uh, age, pretty, um, pretty great kind of diversity of, of ages of people there. Um, predominantly people that identified as non-Indigenous, uh, a few people that said both First Nations and other culture, and one Aboriginal person, five people said other. So here are the questions that we shaped around cultural determinants of health. Um, and the, the blue, the sort of the darker blue is strongly agree. So it was a Leichhardt scale and a, and a bit of space for some uh, qualitative questions at the end. Um, but this part is, uh, so strongly agree is the kind of deeper blue, agree is the green, uh, the bright green, this sort of funky green is neutral. And then we've got disagree and strongly disagree. So I'll give you a chance just to kind of have a look at through some of those questions. There's another page as well. And I set the scene a little bit. We were kind of in some of the most beautiful venues in, in Bantua, the, um, um, that, yeah, that you could imagine in some of the, um, the Ormiston Gorge was one venue. Um, another venue, we're just surrounded by mountains and just really gorgeous um, spaces. Naomi and I had our, our, our uh, iPad, or a, and we started, I think, with a clipboard, um, and we were kind of looking at, you know, really not wanting to interrupt people's experience of the music. So we've sort of had a bit going on, trying to find the right time to talk to people, um, so that they were still really enjoying what was happening. We had partnerships with the the festivals to to be there and um, be be talking to uh, festival goers. So another few of the, we threw a few questions in that we thought might evoke uh, 
uh, strongly, uh, uh, more, more of a disagree, oh wow, that happened quickly, um, a disagree or a strongly disagree to try and keep people from not ticking uh, the same, same boxes. So some of the things that came out um, that were really um, important to note, the strongest level of agreement, I've got to learn how to do this swipe left, swipe right business. Thank God I've never had to do it. Uh, the, the strongest level of agreement uh, was that First Nations music promotes um, self-determination and sovereignty for First Nations people. Uh, the strongest level of disagreement was participating in this event made me feel proud of my culture. Uh, benefits were seen across age groups, so um, a lot of people talked about um, the benefits of listening to First Nations music um, at the at the festival. Um, people across all age groups said they'd like music to be First Nations music to influence government decisions. Older audience members felt more um, more connected to a responsibility of caring for country after the um, after hearing First Nations music at the event. There was a significant difference between um, people from out of town and locals of, of Mbantua, and men, men and women both, um, there were some st statistical differences around some, um, parts of the survey there. People were motivated to change. A lot, a lot of people talked about, I can't believe, like the first thing I'm gonna do is go home and introduce more First Nations, um, language to my grandkids and, and um, share stories and songs and um, a real kind of um, commitment to buying more First Nations music and learning more about culture and sharing that with family, that was a big one. Um, and including First Nations music in their own music making activities, like uh, one lady was a part of a choir and she said, I can't wait to go back and find some um, First Nations songs that we could maybe sing in the choir. Um, uh, there was a few different things that um, made people want to change. So their whole festival experience, someone sa some people said that was all part of it. Other people said it was the musicians and hearing their stories. Um, the music itself, connections made and felt at the event with musicians and other audience members were a motivation for people to change and a combination of music and connecting with country um, during the events. So I'm at the time, I'm at time. Um, we did, just to wrap up, we did talk to people, we asked people to, whether we could talk to them six months time, so um, just to see if things changed or, st or stayed the same. Um, and we did that, we phoned up, we phoned people up and people had a yarn with us about if, if some of the changes um, were, uh, they, whether they were kind of notable differences that lasted um, the, throughout, like after the event. Um, and I'm just trying to find where that slide is. Maybe it's, not, yeah, there. So audience felt they gained a deeper understanding over time so that people did feel like that, con that continued, that understanding. Um, motivation to change was stronger at the time of the event than six months later. Connections made people made and felt at the event lasted over time, and a sense of well-being and connection to country sustained over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy. Thank you for the song. Uh, I'm, I would next like to invite uh, Uncle Kev Starkey, who is joining us on Zoom, and Lachlan Gould to present on Music Producers Development Program, Increasing Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander People's Recording Capacity and Capability. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Thank you. Um, and uh, it's great hearing about the Remedy Project. Now, this project is a, we, let's call this a pitch to everyone here. This project hasn't run. 
Uh, and Uncle Kevin and I have tried a few times to get some funding and we're kind of looking for help. But before we begin, uh, well, I'll first say that, yes, the title has changed. Uh, and it's even changed from what's up there on the screen because we, uh, you know, currently we're, we've arrived at cultural health and wellbeing outcomes for First Nations, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, throughout decision-making roles in the recording studio. So perhaps I'll throw to Uncle Kev to give a bit of an acknowledgement of country for everyone here and online. Thank you, Lachlan. Um, Wanya, Nyan, Kev Starkey, Adja Matna, Nangara Wajiga, Vidapai, on my mother's side, as well as Tower Strait Island side by why our family group on my father's side. Um, I, we pay our respects to the traditional owners of the people in which the country we were on today, and which you stood on today, which is Yoda Terrible people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. And thank everybody for, for coming along today and, and taking the time to listen to what Dr. Lachlan Gould and myself are, are about to deliver to you. As he said, it's a bit of a pitch as well, because we have been struggling to gain attention in this field through the public sector. So I'll hand back over to Lachlan. Well, uh, Uncle Kev, while you're there, perhaps um, start with the slide that we're on there where you introduce yourself. Well, there you go. That, that, I just explained um, where my cultural connectivity comes from on my mother's side, which is in South Australia, all the way to the Torres Straits on my dad's side. Um, but I'm the owner and founder of Darkwood Studio Record Label Service. We're the only Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander privately owned um, business in that field in Australia. Um, and I also work as a, a senior fellow for the University of Sunshine Coast and also a Community Research Associate for the Remedy Project. Um, so I'm also the Elder in Residence for Queensland Music as, and a Senior Cultural and Arts Advisor to Federal Government. So I, I get to see a whole range of every aspect of, of where we sit within the, the scope of First Nations music within the industry. Thanks, Kev. Um, so Uncle Kev approached me, like Darkwood, part of Darkwood's remit is a recording studio. And um, through my research, um, I've kind of noticed a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion gaps in the recording sector. Uh, so I'm, I'm a music producer, I've been a music producer my whole life. Uh, I probably consider myself a music producer more than I do an academic. Uh, so I'm an ECR still, uh, and um, those of you of a certain age, and of Australian heritage uh, may know me um, uh, as Magoo, uh, so in the 90s. I was big in the 90s. <laughs> so let's carry on. Um, so through my PhD research, um, the, this term democratisation of, of uh, music technology came up a lot. Um, and through you know, the software development, we all have multi-track recorders on our phones now, and there's this notion that everyone has access, like if you've got a laptop, smartphone, recording interface, microphone, and reliable internet, which is a big one, that you have access to recording your own music and being a producer yourself. Um, however, this term has been uh, slowly kind of uh, dismantled uh, and Adam Bell in 2015 declared that the su su supposed democratisation of music making ushered in by the DAW, the Digital Audio Workstation, I'll try not to give too many producer terms out there, um, uh, has not actually occurred. Now, he arrived at this by doing a quick survey uh, in New York um, on home recordists. And in 2015, he found that of these home recorders, only 104 participants, that 89% were male and 11% were female. So there's already this disparity in gender. Uh, but I recently conducted a survey for MPEG, the Music Producer and Engineers Guild of Australia. And in that survey, like this year, uh, we found very similar numbers, 85.8% male, 11.3% female, 1.9% non-binary, 2.8% prefer not to say. So this issue is, you know, re remains, it hasn't changed. Um, so if we look more at uh, race, um, Bell's analysis found that 70% of his respondents were white Caucasian, when in New York at the time, 
uh, that representation was 44 percent. Uh, it's a very multicultural area in, in New York. In the survey that I did for MPEG, there were no Indigenous respondents. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I know there's uh, Indigenous practitioners out there and it's, it's not conclusive evidence that they haven't joined a guild, you know, fair enough, I, I sort of get that, but it's still a little bit indicative of, of um, the disparities that are showing up and, you know, being a white male myself, uh, you know, the, I see a lot of white males in the production space. So my, my uh, PhD research revealed my, I sort of focused in on recording space and DIY recording practice versus the traditional kind of uh, large format recording processes. And like I, I found that recording no longer needs to take place in these large format styled studios. And in fact, I argue that now uh, recording in home based scenarios is more prevalent than recording in these um, purpose built spaces that we might find in a conservatoire like this. Um, now, I might throw to Uncle Kev here to talk about how uh, First Nations uh, would prefer to record on country and that DIY or home-based recording scenarios uh, w opens up an opportunity for that to happen. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, with the, the, when we speak of the term on country, it's a, a term that we hold dear to ourselves as First Nations peoples. Um, and that's that, that intrinsic connectivity that we all have to our, our traditional lands and, and ancestral roots. When we're taken away from the ability to connect into that space, be it if we're a resident in a community and then have to leave to record, there's a massive deficit of the cultural connected spirituality that affects the creative um, purpose behind the person and there's a desire to not be in the space in, in, in the modern colonial space. They, would, they wish to be back on country with family and connected again. That, that is one thing that I experienced myself and have recently as well. And the, the effect it has on a First Nations person here is of, it, it's so massive, it, it, it leaves a a spiritual, an emotional, a mental, and a physical whole within that one person. So that that a bit of feedback is that having that ability to be on country with our people, to be able to in our homes, to be able to create our music for our people in our time, on our space, on our lands. That I feel is a better way to create and capture creativity. Um, not only in a modern format or a pop format of music, but knowing the way the mechanism of a community works. If there's somebody in that community working in that space with a home studio, they will be approached by an elder at some time to be requested to record their song, which may belong to their family and their family line, might be an auntie's and mum's song and grandmother's song or grandfather's song. And then we have the ability to capture that traditional ancient language and oral history in a digital format for preservation. Um, something that we, we really are missing out on as well, not only the creative possibilities coming from those communities and that person with the recording facility. Thanks, Uncle Kev. So I, I think I've built up, we, we've, we've spoken a lot about the problem and the possibilities. Like we, we're really excited by this possibility of um, uh, reducing knowledge hierarchies that exist so that um, Indigenous people are more, uh, First Nations people are more likely to be able to record on country. Um, now, there's, you know, more stuff around, you know, the, the issue and the problem. Um, infrastructure is a bit of a problem, you know, access to broadband is a problem for First Nations people uh, in this country. Um, RMIT recently did uh, mapping the, the digital gap and I will not uh, sit on that slide for too long, uh, but the national average for digital inclusion is 7.5% lower for First Nations people and that includes remote 
uh, and urban-based uh, First Nations people. So that's a kind of an issue that is all wrapped up in this studio democratisation. The internet is a big part of it, not just for the functionality of the studio, but also for uh, knowledge seeking, like uh, seeking out uh, recording techniques and uh, things like that. Uh, so we've, you know, just quickly, the, the idea that uh, Uncle Kev and I, Uncle Kev's come to me to uh, build this music producers development program where, um, uh, yep, just making sure I'm on the right slide, where <laughs> we're, we're hoping to address some of these gaps. So together we'll um, try and, we're, we're trying to build these seven day workshops where we will, via an expression of interest, um, uh, Im embed some do-it-yourself recording approaches and um, uh, recording studio maintenance, digital archiving at the, the studios at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Like there's, I obviously would like to do it outside of uh, the recording studio, but the idea is to uh, bring them in and develop um, uh, the, the program. Our time is up. Um, I, I, I just will, there's just more detail there on what we're doing. Um, so in all of this, we've got this amazing opportunity to get some First Nations participants in and ask them, have yarning sessions, have storyboarding, um, basically gather some data, and I, this is a bit of a pitch to um, try and uh, hopefully a health and wellbeing academic, like I'm a music producer, Uncle Kev is a First Nations producer. If we can get some uh, a health and well-being academic that's interested in the First Nations space in on the project to help us analyse the data that we can capture from um, these workshops. Yeah. Thank and you. It's, it's also the cultural health and well-being. It's also the cultural yes. health and well-being as well. That 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 that's health and well-being comes in many many different aspects, and and that's that's what I'm taking a little bit of time here because I'm not there. Um, <laughs> sorry, people, but yes, that it is that cultural health and well-being, and um, myself through Darkwood have already attained um, a gamut of philanthropic support in in hardware, um, tech hardware as well, um, as well as uh, with the supply of digital audio workspaces as well for this program. So we do need assistance in in helping bring it to fruition. So please keep that in mind, and thank you. Yeah. Brutal being a timekeeper. These are incredible projects, so I hope we have time to be able to delve in more. Um, thank you so much, Uncle Kev, and thank you, Lachlan. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Wendy Brooks, who's going to present the social impact of an early childhood mu music class in a regional town. Wendy. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, and good morning, everybody. Oh, I can work it too. Um, oh, but we're not. Oh, um, I'm just trying to take one moment to um, offer you a little bit of context around this because I'm very conscious that there is a young conservatorium as part of Griffith, Griffith University, and I know that because they ring us every now and again for enrolments. So <laughs> I'm not from Young Conservatorium at Griffith University, but Young Regional Conservatorium is one of 17 community-owned and operated music education hubs that are scattered across the state of New South Wales. The conservatoriums are collectively referred to as the Association of New South Wales Regional Conservatoriums, and they're partially funded by the Department of Education. Young Regional Conservatorium, where I am from, is located in the town of Young, which is the cherry capital of Australia, on the southwest slopes of the state, uh, it has a population of about seven and a half thousand people and the service area of the conservatorium runs about 170 kilometres north to south and about 170 kilometres east to west. So we're looking at a big, a big area. Like the other regional conservatoriums in the state, the core business of the conservatorium is individual instrumental and vocal tuition but we also deliver school-based programs, both curricular, classroom programs, and also school bands and choirs. We run several, several community ensembles and classes, such as the early childhood class, which is at the center of this presentation. 
Just as we move on, underlying this presentation is the notion of place-based thinking. As we heard in Catherine's presentation on Monday, our regional towns can face quite unique challenges due to their geographical location. And place-based thinking not only recognises these challenges, but also acknowledges the location's endogenous potential. And highlight, importantly, it highlights opportunity over disadvantage. Beginning this early childhood music program for our conservatorium was an opportunity for outreach and growth into a nearby township, we call it nearby, it's 70 kilometres away, of Cowra. Cowra has a population of about 10,000 people and is part of our growth area. The funding agreement that we hold with the Department of Education requires us to offer early childhood classes, so this proposed class was also viewed as a means to help us meet that KPM. But it also aligned with our vision, which we're working really hard on framing all of our programs at the moment. And it's not something that we're trying to do to inspire learning career and connect, but we see that as a, as a reciprocal action between all of the members of our community. So the inspiring learning and connecting is part of what we do. Music making with young children is an inherently social activity. And the primary objective for this class was to foster the musical interactions between the babies and young children and their carers. Australia's Early Years Learning Framework, which is the guiding document for early childhood education in Australia, promotes these such musical interactions as contributing to communication and interaction development. But the other things that, that have been found to be really important are a contribution to social skills, um, social, communication and social skills being nurtured, the transmission of musical culture, sensory stimulation and rich language experiences. And young children are being provided an opportunity to, to practice, to imitate and to develop their singing and movement and improvisation. And just to remind us of what these look like and because every presentation should have a little bit of music, my towards that objective, there were some unforeseen outcomes which indicated to us that the impact of the class went beyond the musical. So I would just like to introduce you to some of the participants of the class. This is Soku. Soku is two and a half and his family belongs to the 4% of Cabra residents that speak a language other than English in their home. Soku's family have come to Cowra from Mongolia. Each week, Soku comes to music with an adult family member. This day, it was his grandfather. Sometimes it's his uncle. Sometimes his grandmother. Soku listens and watches, but he rarely sings or dances with the other children. In this photo, you can see that his grandfather was tapping the beat of the song on his leg. Soku's carers are very attentive in the class, and they try to participate in some of the songs, particularly those that are language-focused. It's more common with his uncle than with his grandfather. On the day of this photo, Soku barely moved from this position, but the other children in the class, each time there was a change of song, brought him another instrument or some ribbons to, to move and so on. And they either put him on his lap or they took his hand and put them in his hand for him. Soku's grandfather is included in the adult banter in the room and he often nods enthusiastically and smiles. Oh, I had two grandmothers in the class, but they were really, really not okay with being photographed. So it's very, very sad, but we have some clip art um, to represent them, which is a pity because they're two gorgeous women. These women care for their grandchildren while the parents are at work, and they appear to have become friends. They sit together each week, and at the end of class, they head off to have some morning tea together. 
During an informal chat with these women, they recounted how nervous they had been before coming to class for the first time. They were concerned that their thinking was out of date with the newfangled ways of caring for children. One of the women spoke about her daughter, the, the child's mum, and her reliance on her phone and Dr Google for advice about how she should care for and raise the child. And she said that she felt quite redundant that her advice was considered old-fashioned. So for me, it was very heartening when she said she felt at home in the class. And yesterday in Gillian's um, presentation about the women at Bio Biogawi, I hope I've got that almost right, Gillian, Gillian spoke of the woman who wanted to share their language, their stories and their culture with their little ones. And this was so evident in these women, I thought, I thought that connection with what Gillian was saying. When we first advertised this class for naught to five-year-olds and began taking enrolments, we were a little bit surprised that many of the children were born in 2021 because we thought naught to five will get it, you know, a, a range, and we didn't. Um, we wondered whether it was because a lot of three and four-year-olds were already in preschool. But as it turned out, after a little investigating, these were our COVID lockdown babies. The COVID lockdown babies were all that came to our class were all the first child in their family and their mums had missed out on the social support that is usually offered to first-time mums. They didn't get to attend antenatal classes or postnatal classes. There were no groups for them facilitated by community nurses, no play groups, no breastfeeding Australia meetings, and no way for them to find or meet with other mums in the town. These mums clutch onto any opportunity presented to meet and interact together. As the music class ends, they gather up their children in their prams and they head to a nearby coffee shop alongside the grandmothers, not with them, but alongside them. And I asked one of the mums, so have you found that you've got a lot in common? And her response was, no, just the kids and how hard it's been. The presentations that we've seen and heard over the last two days have been very inspiring. And yesterday afternoon, I found myself balking at doing this presentation and sharing this simple story alongside those great big projects. However, I believe that this ex story is extraordinary in the impact that has come from something very ordinary. The children and their carers are real, they are human. And the impact of this 30 minutes a week shouldn't be underestimated. As communication continues to be fostered, community networks continue to develop, and the well-being of the participants remains a central focus. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, which is Lauren Istvanditi. And she's going to produce or present her um, presentation on music making, cultural stories, and well being a creative heritage approach. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so, yes, my name is Dr. Lauren Istvanditi, and um, in this short paper, I'm going to take up time to um, introduce to you my concept of creative heritage. Um, it's, a, it's a transdisciplinary um, a research method and a concept that I'm developing. So I'm going to talk about research that I've done and research that I'm yet to do, which is always ambitious. So uh, I'm going to start out, I'm going to jump straight into it. Um, what is creative heritage? So this is a participatory method that seeks to engage creativity and cultural heritage in ways that assist specific communities to activate those parts of their histories that might be silent within archives or those parts of their collective experiences that are largely undocumented. The creative heritage method can help to amplify meaningful narratives where participants are asked to create new artistic works inspired by institutional um, and community collections and stories. This could be done through a range of art forms, um, but the work I've done so far is just centred on music. Um, you could use um, dance or textiles or poetry or lots of other things, but just uh, I've just started with music. So why? What, why would we do creative heritage? Um, uh, 
what do you get from doing this kind of work? So um, the first thing that Creative Heritage um, can do is engage diverse or minority communities in telling their own stories through the arts. And the second is providing a more accessible way for the greater community to access those stories. The application of this method has the potential to address the needs of both cultural groups whose intangible cultural heritage especially can be easily lost or overlooked. And it also um, looks to heritage institutions whose collections are increasingly seen as static and divorced from um, our uh, diversifying society. So the method um, itself is not actually about reenactment. It's not about reenacting um, traditional um, cultural heritage and it's not necessarily about recreating um, either, but it is about making connections between the past and the present in new ways. So to demonstrate the method in action, I want to give a really quick overview of my pilot project that was carried out a few years ago. Uh, so that was carried out here at the Queensland Conservatorium in partnership with the State Library of Queensland and the Queensland Jazz Community. It grew from a research project that sought to find more materials, oral histories and recordings um, that could contribute to a better preserved history of jazz in Queensland. Uh, so the next phase of that project is where I started to develop this creative heritage method. Um, because yes, you can collect all of these stories from the community and you can lodge them in an archive, but they are still fairly silent. Um, people aren't necessarily going to the archive to dig them out. So how can we amplify those stories for everybody? Um, so briefly, um, I commissioned, um, see if I have my little picture here. Um, I commissioned uh, renowned jazz composers to write eight new pieces. I gave them very specific parameters. Um, and I gave them a series of heritage vignettes. So each had a different um, a collection of heritage materials. So I gave them um, documents, photographs, text, um, some of the oral histories that I'd recorded with um, people around Queensland and any recorded music I could find. Uh, from the past. And um, so this was from the community and from the existing archive at the State Library. Uh, and so that they drew inspiration from those who create new pieces. The resulting pieces were then professionally recorded by an eight-piece band of students and professional musicians. And then we did a series of gigs in Brisbane where I then um, you know, narrated and explained those pieces um, and, and highlighted um, some of you know, the greatest stories coming from um, my, my work looking at history of jazz in Queensland. Uh, so I wanted to just play um, a minute and a bit. Um, so just so you get a sense, everybody likes to hear a bit of music in these. So you might just start our video halfway through. <laughs> project, I noticed there was a potential for these creative heritage activities to affect the participants in different ways, depending on the role that they might have played, and um, the kind of histories or heritage that was at hand. So the jazz community is, uh, I guess, a minority cultural community, and I saw um, the benefits to connecting communities with the roots of um, their practice, and allowing these um, people in the present to create something new, and there's that sense of a continuum of practice with the past. So um, this led me to connect creative heritage with other things that I've been researching, um, including um, well-being and migrant cultural heritage, 
Um, and I've also, in the meantime, started to look at how um, museums and other heritage institutions uh, were engaging with creativity and creative practice. And so a very recent literature review um, reveals that uh, in scholarship, there just isn't a lot of documented practice of um, bringing communities in to create artistic works, drawing on collections, and then actually having those um, amplified in different ways. So, uh, I noticed a really neat triangulation of research areas and there's this really neat gap in the centre and I thought, well, maybe this is where creative heritage has its um, next step. So, this is what I'm calling the nexus, but there will be a more compelling title forthcoming. Um, but the nexus is these areas of heritage and creativity and wellbeing. So, we know that there is a lot of existing evidence about the ways in which the arts and music in particular is integral for various aspects of people's well-being and I don't need to explain that to the room. Um, we know that for people from diverse backgrounds within diasporic contexts, uh, so migrants and refugees, engagement with creative aspects of their um, traditional or home culture, culture, so in the form of cultural maintenance, is a really important factor for their well-being. We also know that um, engagement with heritage in all of its forms. So that could be cultural heritage, but it can also be environmental heritage and built heritage and lots of other forms, um, has been shown to positively affect well-being in other ways as well. And there is also a role for the greater glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums to play. Um, along with this, the representation of diverse cultural heritage um, within these places has well-being outcomes for particular populations, including these same diverse and minority cultural groups. Um, so we have in the heritage sector this growing awareness and some developing action to reframe collections, to reframe curation, the way collections are um, uh, put forward to better reflect principles of human rights, um, ethical communication and better representation of these communities that um, museums are claiming to represent. So, you know, for example, that the move to decolonise the museum is, is one of those. Um, we know that representation of diverse communities matters and that from doing that there are clear wellbeing um, outcomes. So, um, creative heritage is something that can pull all of these things together. It is a method for preservation. It's a method that engages the arts and it's a method that it can engage communities in telling their own stories and it can therefore have um, some impact on um, well-being as well. So the next step um, in developing this is to um, uh, move forward with my ARC DECRA uh, fellowship, thank you, um, which is um, going to be based around this concept. So um, I'm looking to investigate the effects of, the, of this method on the well-being of people from migrant groups living in southeast Queensland and drawing them um, into conversation with some of our key heritage institutions like the Queensland Museum and the State Library of Queensland. It's worth noting that Queensland doesn't have an, immig uh, an immigration museum or a migration museum. Most other states do um, have somewhere where these cultures can be represented. Um, so uh, the um, communities um, that I'm looking to work with um, will have the opportunity to preserve their cultural stories and objects relating to their migration and their settlement and to create new music that is um, storying uh, their experience. In the final stages, then we'll come together for a really nice musical celebration, um, something else that can be recorded and preserved and, um, and amplified. Uh, so in doing this, um, this is a form of cultural maintenance for communities. Um, it can impact individual and collective well-being and then foster a sense of belonging in modern Australia. And it has those broader community impacts too where um, other um, cultures um, can uh, come and take part and, and experience uh, what other cultures have been through, what um, people living in the diaspora are, are dealing with. So I'm hoping to benefit communities, publics and institutions and to further establish the nexus um, with colleagues, uh, with community groups um, and to look to um, push that forward as a way of integrating, um, you know, the industry into these aspects of community wellbeing. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Lauren. Finally, I'm going to invite Graham Settler to the stage to talk about engagement versus outreach, political and ethical considerations for the symphony orchestra as an agent of social change. Over to you. Why, thank you. Kia ora koutou, ko Graham Settler aho, kai whakahare matua CEO of the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra um, in Ototai Christchurch, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Look at that. Uh, I just a little bit of a, um, well, I'll explain. Politics in, in the context of, of what I'm feeling and the way that we're working is more about uh, the, the responsibility, um, not the sort of nefarious uh, underpinnings of, of politics. Um, the responsibility of governance, uh, as it says there, sagacious and prudent regulation of social behaviour, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of ethics, uh, I'm talking about um, the system and the consideration for us as a system, as it says there, of accepted beliefs that control behaviour, especially such a system based on morals, um, and that's a little uh, definition from the online Cambridge Dictionary, and engagement for us uh, in the place uh, where, I, where I live and work currently is about participating in an activity through one's own pre-existing or emergent interest having, and this is a gorgeous little bit of definition also from the Cambridge Dictionary, I decided it was rather lovely, um, one part of a machine fit into and move together with another part of a machine. I should also just say that um, prior to moving to Aotearoa, I was, uh, which was almost two years ago, uh, like Wendy, I was responsible for regional conservatoriums, a couple of them, in New South Wales and uh, living and working in Wiradjuri country in central western New South Wales. So, um, apologies to Simon Sinek, and I'm not going to go why first, I'm going to go what first. Uh, Professional Symphony Orchestra, the organisation that we're dealing with, I'm going to do this if I may, there'll be no feedback. Um, a Professional Symphony Orchestra in what is really a small or medium-sized city, uh, fewer than 400,000, um, Ototai Christchurch. And it is formally, and thank you to um, Te uh, this morning's um, session, uh, was really instructive, hopefully for everybody, talking about treaty uh, and um, the different definitions in uh, uh, Te Reo Māori and, of course, with the settlers. But uh, we are in what is formally bicultural society and a multicultural society um, with the Western European settler culture uh, established in the mid-19th century. That's kind of the setting within which we work. And, um, as it says, they're situated in Ototai Christchurch, uh, a community that has, as have many other um, communities, experienced some substantial trauma in the recent living past. The program uh, that I'm referencing is a five-strand, 32-project program of um, what we call in the community Keti uh, Hapori um, activity, with active engagement as the premise, active, active engagement. We uh, are working with 34 employee musicians uh, with community engagement uh, responsibilities as a contractual obligation. That sounds a bit scary, but with a contractual obligation, they do sign on knowingly, I've got to tell you. Um, and that uh, engagement is notionally uh, between about 23 on and 32% um, of their uh, workload or of, of the requirement. I say between 23 and 32 per cent because there are sort of different tiers within the employment, employee base. And that's delivering an average uh, balance um, individual players of about 30 per cent community engagement activity and 70 per cent uh, main stage. But as an organisation, uh, we are actually delivering 60 per cent um, community engagement activity and 40 per cent main stage sort of heritage symphonic um, activity. The, in 2023, that's 241 made stage performances, 226 community engagement um, touch points. You might think, how do those figures measure up? Well, um, obviously or not obviously, the main stage performances have uh, a, a sort of a, a load um, of rehearsals that uh, is, is not a sort of a similar thing with community engagement. Many of the community engagement activities are um, programs that run over a year or over you know, several sessions, so there's not the same load of rehearsals. Engage cohorts, um, and again, engaged means actively engaged. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, 
what we do in our community and our series of communities is engage as, as broadly and as deeply as we are able, as we are invited, as we are welcomed uh, to do. And so, roughly speaking, ac across you know, most cohorts, youth, um, disability, communities impermanently housed, uh, corrections, um, both sort of uh, uh, in detention and community corrections, um, age communities, uh, recreational ensembles, recreational players, gifted and talented students as they are um, identified in different ways in different communities, different parts of the communities, early childhood uh, schools, migrant and refugee uh, communities, um, and we also engage. We are not a university, we're a, a symphony orchestra, but we engage. Uh, with university and university um, communities as well. Back to um, Simon Sinek, I can do the why now. The reason that we operate, I can't say exist because I've only been there for two years, but our why is in providing and affording access for all to the benefits of music participation, uh, directly or through um, partnerships. Access to musicking as a safe and direct medium for comprehensive emotional expression. Um, and just to pick up on something, and I apologise, I can't remember who mentioned the, the sort of the phrase of, of whether in these past few days, uh, whether what we're doing is for them. Um, that's a large part of our, our, our reason for being is that people know that it, music, music activity, musicking, is for them. The, our why is not to preserve Western European um, heritage art form of orchestral art music. That happens, but that is not our why. The tenets of the program are the, um, in the community, particularly um, Keti Hapori program, which as I say is 60% of our output. Uh, for and with um, that is engagement, not to the broader community. I uh, make a definition there with outreach. For me and for us, um, we don't do outreach. For, for us, reaching out is not what we do. Uh, we um, embrace, uh, we work with, we work in. Um, we don't reach out. Community engagement versus audience development. Um, when I was interviewed uh, for the job and I was asked um, what my ideas were about audience development, because of course I don't know whether you've noticed, but in some parts of the world, audiences for symphony orchestras are kind of dying. Um, but what I said was I don't really believe in audience development, I believe in community engagement. And if it's valid, folks will come along. Um, the imperative is to maintain and develop relevance. Not develop and maintain, but maintain and develop relevance. Uh, inclusion as action. Inclusion as a doing word. Um, thank you, Diana, by the way. Uh, and demonstration and invitation, by which I mean we, we do. We do the musicking thing and we invite. Uh, and again, engagement, participation with. There is one program amongst our 32 or 34 or whatever it is that is listening only, I'll fess up to that, that is um, as per the desire of the particular aged cohort who want chamber music concerts in their facility and that is essentially a participation by listening but that is the only one that is, uh, that is listening only. In terms of the politics that we deal with, the internal politics, the why for the players, we have um, professional musicians, I mean the 34 employees, we have a pool of about 80. The fact of the matter is that, you know, most players who want to be in a symphony orchestra want to be in a symphony orchestra for heritage reasons. Um, so that's internal politics. External politics, we, with our funding, um, which is not enormous, but particularly in, in terms of both central government and local government, um, we can be seen as a political tool. We have to deal with that. Uh, we are the recipient of the greatest annual community activity grant in our city. It's not a huge amount of money, but we are. We get more money than anybody else, and that is a significant political consideration for us. Um, and corporate support, sim similarly. We are the most active provider of um, musical uh, engagement activities in the city. Do we have a right to be that or to do that? That's a consideration. And we can be understandably seen as the establishment, and that's a political concern. Again, as I say, a responsibility to, to manage the way that we're seen and also the way that we operate responsibly. Ethically, for whom and why do we exist? Um, serving the communities through music versus serving the business. 
we looking after the viability of the art form? Is that a responsibility? We need to be ethical. And are those things oppositional or are they confluent? Serving the community and looking after the viability of the art form. I want to finish, and Diana and a few other people in this room have probably seen this provocation, but it's one that I live with and that I really love to discuss and have considered. Can a professional music performance organisation, in brackets, us, a symphony orchestra, um, also be the leading provider? And by leading, that's a provocative word in itself, um, the leading provider of community music activity in its community, should it be, or should a professional music performance organisation be the leading provider of CM activity in its community, and can it be? The invitation is, shamelessly here, um, we are not a university, we have relationships with universities. But here's an invitation to partner on a research project that investigates the development, relevance and viability of a symphony orchestra as an agent of social cohesion and change in a post-trauma setting with the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra as a primary case study. Thank you. It's quite the provocation to lead us with. I'll invite everyone to come and grab a seat and we can open to questions. Um, I don't know if I'm... Hello. Oh, hi. So um, I believe Alexis Callio is our online facilitator. So those of you who are tuning in online, um, she'll flag, flag us down if, uh, if you have any questions to pose for our panelists. Wow. Holy smokes, where to even begin? It, it's such an incredible um, diversity, yet also some really interesting threads kind of weaving through and lots of ways to be thinking about the role of music in terms of right from early childhood educations, we're thinking about education, music as cultural production, um, music and, and history, but also it's not history. I think it's actually clear, like your Lauren is very clear in your project, but actually it's clear everywhere, right, in terms of cultural histories, colonization, um, and how those things are affecting our relationships now, and the use of music to shift some of those, to try to open up space, to shift. I feel like I'm sitting in front of you a bit. Um, yeah, um, and I'm also thinking about, um, so music is production, also uh, audiences, so uh, Graham's point around listening, like there's only one project that's listening, but then I'm thinking about your project where actually listening was really a critical piece in terms of education, in terms of transformation. Um, so uh, as you're thinking about your very deep provocative questions, um, I'm going to ask you and I, I'm going to take uh, Uncle Kev's um, l last comment around the, the social well, social health and well-being, which if several of you, maybe everyone to some extent focused on. Um, but also this idea that there's, there's cultural health. So I, I, I would wonder if, if you might invite you all to, to speak to that a bit more. And I'm also curious about the economic impact. So if you want to talk about like economic health, a little bit was also sparked by the, culture, the production workshop where you're focusing on social health and well-being, but I'm also thinking it's the um, cultural production, like a, a, the means of production, like it, is there, is there um, a hope here to build like economic power, I will say? I don't know if that's the right word, but is there economic health viability in terms of who is producing music, who is, who is performing music? So I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll offer that. I don't know if anyone feels like they would like to begin. Uncle, are we looking to Uncle Kev maybe? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Uncle Kev, can you begin? Um, yes, yes, and thank you for that. And, when, when we, when I, when I mentioned the, the term cultural well-being and wellness, um, that's something that has been that the connective of mob and country and spirituality has been the driving force of the evolution of our culture. That connective works and being on country and that that is well-being. That is the health of our culture. And that sits within, not just in within our community, it, it sits within us as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples as well. And that's, that all comes together in that sense. Um, and as I mentioned before, myself, I, I, I suffered quite heavily, quite a lot, because I work in, heavily in a colonial state with culture 
and trying to deliver the best aspect of cultural representation, appropriate representation within the, the arts of this country. And that saps on you. And because I'm working in that space, it, it drains upon my cultural spirituality and my wellness and my health, cultural health, not being able to be able to re-engage because there's so much um, drain upon the knowledge for that by bringing me out of that space. Um, and, and yet in doing that, in, in saying that, what I do, as we all know, we only represent 3.82% of the populace of this country. And then when you look at the music industry in this country, we don't even represent 0.05% of, of, of representation within that. So that is what I consider a massive disparity or to use the current term, another gap um, that needs to be addressed. And um, by being able to empower that self-determination of creation on country by First Nations peoples will give them the ability to create correctly with value and with integrity, but also give them then the ability to deliver their content in a, a commercial format of, of sense and give them a, a, a stance of economic wealth within the industry as well. Well, again, like I could just only just add to uh, um, what Uncle Kev was saying there. Um, I, I, like I, I like the words empowering. And, you know, from my experience in the recording studio, uh, probably the most key ingredient in the recording studio is trust. And it's, you've already got barriers there if there isn't that representation in the studio. And, um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've just, th there are so many gaps and disparities within the recording studio sector. And I, I guess from a personal point of view, I'm just trying to help bring down some of those barriers. And hopefully from that, there can be some kind of cultural and economic benefits seen. Yeah. Thanks, Uncle Kev and Lachlan. Um, I was thinking when, when you were all talking about this idea of cultural determinants of health and social emotional well-being, which is a really um, well-referenced popular model of First Nations health in this country, and I think it relates to what we saw in Aotearoa, TOD, as well, in terms of a very holistic model. Um, but Christy and I were having a yarn this morning, getting ready for our little talk, and you know, I was really thinking, this is a thread through the whole conference for me, is that in the area of cultural health, or cultural health determinants, it's things like connection to country, connection to spirit, ancestors, culture, community, self, you know, First, First Nations people have ultimate agency in that space. We are doing it, you know, like our elders are holding that space and that is a sovereign space. And then all the stuff around it is the environmental and political and social determinants stuff. And one of the things that I didn't say out loud on the other day in the keynote speech was something that I think is really important to think about when we're talking about cultural health determinants versus the surrounding stuff that's not really, you know, in as much in the hands of First Nations people ourselves, is that our health, well-being and healing does not have to rely on the coloniser being ready to say sorry. And I think it's in that space of self-determination in a cultural health and well-being space that that is most evident, you know. And, and I know that that might be contentious because at the same time I want to recognise all of the effects of the systems and structures around us. But at the same time, you know, that is a space of strength, of custodianship. And, you know, like, we're not waiting. We're not waiting. You know, we are doing this, you know, and we, we're we not stopping, I guess. So, and I heard that in Teodi's talk today and I heard it in Sandy's response as well. So, that's a tension for me is, um, you know, keeping this strength going, the readiness, you know, it's almost like fast twitch muscle readiness to jump while the bigger systems and structures stuff is 
Is it, is it going to dismantle? Is it going to be changed incrementally over time? I don't know. I think these are questions really running through this whole conference for me. Can I just make a quick comment too? Um, within my, where I'm positioned currently, um, and in relation also to politics and ethics, um, the, there is no waiting as a, as a profoundly, if there's such a thing, Pakeha, um, member of the, the community in Ototei, and as a leader, which I, I will use the word leader, that's, that's my position, of an overwhelmingly Pakeha organisation. Um, the, 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 all the will that we have to work within the cultural health of those who have been there for a long time before we've been there. All of that will uh, needs to be, and the work we do and try to do, is to, 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 to do that in parallel with all of those things that can't, mustn't and don't wait for us. But, and then to consider that if a structure like ours, which is absolutely heritage, if uh, Western European heritage, I should say, if a structure like ours deserves to exist, then it's the job of people like me to just kind of to try to balance and to try to lead the way that, that we kind of morph and change within those structures that mustn't slow down, that mustn't change. But of course, the thing for us is that if we're not relevant, if we can't uh, uh, meet that resettling or that, that health, then we are irrelevant and we don't deserve to exist. Um, and an interesting political thing for me is <laughs> that just how loudly I say that within the structure that I work. Because that's my belief, we're either relevant or we're not. And if we're not, we simply shouldn't be there. But um, it's interesting working politically within those, um, within that shape and the landscape, which we can see, and it takes, it's going to take a very long time, but we can see that the way that settles, and speaking as a Pākehā and, and you know, somebody who's recently, only recently, in the environment that I'm in, um, yeah, it, it, we, we will get there or we won't. Um, and if we don't, we don't deserve to be there. Any Do we have some questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you, everybody. I have two questions that I'm relaying from folks online who are either in busy, noisy offices or in the middle of the night. Um, and lucky you, Graham, because they're both directed in, in your direction. Uh, so the first question comes from Tina Reynard, and she asks about the artistic output of the orchestra and so what kinds of music is played and yep. what kinds of artistic strategies are employed. And she's asking that because you mentioned that tension and yep. that maybe your role is not necessarily to preserve classical music. Yep. Um, so she's particularly curious to know what, what you're playing since um, there's also refugees with other backgrounds and. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, to, to sort of boring old figures wise, um, our 24 season that was just released is 30% uh, is music that has been created within um, the motto, within um, Aotearoa. That's not something for me to say super proudly, but um, that's, that's, it's 30% music that's been created um, from within. Uh, uh, far less than that. Um, is created, uh, has been created by um, Māori. Uh, and I'll say something a little bit more about that in a moment, but we certainly do um, the, the Western European canon. But again, if we can think about that 30%, at least 30%, actually. Um, the challenge then is to make the invitation trusted enough for... Um, for instance, Māori, Pacifica um, and other uh, cultural groups to contribute to our output. And I see that as a long-term investment of trust. Um, that is uh, certainly our uh, part of our agenda and we make that as clear as we can. We don't fool ourselves that we can rush that process because, of course, we don't live in fear, we're not frightened, but we're totally conscious that that trust in our intention will only settle um, when it's clear that we're trusted and trustworthy, um, that's a bit of an answer, I hope. It's a great answer, thank you. And uh, if I may continue from, with a question from Matthew O'Leary, um, who's asking if there's opportunities for more communal listening experiences, especially when access to live performances is difficult or restricted, 
and especially to increase exposure of non-Western musics. And then I'll also note that once you talk sense. about communal listening a little bit, that yeah. Uncle Kev would like to weigh in on this discussion too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yes. So the, the answer to the communal listening, again, uh, 226 in a year um, in the community, mostly outside of the Taj Mahal, that is our wonderful um, performance venue, but outside of that, uh, in community um, uh, locations all over, um, not just Christchurch, but also the region. Um, and each and every one of those cohorts that I mention, and that's not really a comprehensive list, uh, is engaged in, invited to and engaged in um, musicking in that broader sense. And so not just listening, but certainly listening, but also engaging um, it, it to, and, and that includes um, non uh, non-hearing members of the community too. So um, yes, there's a, it, 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 our agenda is to make musicking as, it sounds twee, but it's true, to make musicking as, as accessible and as, a part of every, as much a part of everyone's life in the region as we possibly can. Uncle Kev, you wanna? Um, yeah, to yes, please. This is uh, to Graham as well, um, in respect to what he, what he does. Um, I mentioned earlier, I, I sit as a uh, senior advisor to Creative Australia and federal government on, on cultural arts. And my position in, in that role is to, to ensure that the, the organisations are adhering to the, the correct um, implementation of cultural content aspects, programs, and not just audience, but practitioners. And um, what, I, what I have found in this country is, um, and it reflects on what I mentioned before about our percentage disparity is, we only have a very few, we call them the, the, the Holy Trinity really, that can actually work within that space here in Australia that have the ability to get out and perform, create and deliver. Um, we're trying to make space for that. Are you doing that within your organisation? Are there are there avenues there for First Nations um, future development within that org to deliver in that Western space? Thank you for that. That's um, I actually really appreciate that question. So again, coming to politics, the 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 challenge there that relates specifically to that, if I understand your question, I hope I do, is the way into a symphony orchestra, which is still that great big heavy leaden door of the audition, regardless of any other um, uh, ways to gain access, um, whether that's by way of internships or, or any of that stuff that we do. Um, we're, we're very much rethinking that process of getting to the inside. So the other part of that equation is partnering increasingly with um, our local university uh, who have and are developing uh, programs of, of engagement and involvement with um, uh, Maori and Pacifica uh, uh, communities. And we're partnering with them on um, uh, strategies for uh, things including internships, but also other ways, I'll say, to the inside of the orchestra, as well as engaging with First Nations people um, and in uh, materials, putting forward materials um, and performing with. Does that answer the question? I may have misunderstood it. No, no it, it does. And, right. and, it, and it's, as, as you mentioned before, it's generally through the, the guild format of um, you must be trained, you, then you go to your auditions and you have to have a certain level of skill. And yet when we speak about First Nations music and um, intrinsic music capabilities and working in that orchestral space, we have people in the like of William Barton here who works amazing in that space on a cultural aspect and, and can fuse that. Do you have um, anything like that working within you or, or scope for that development into the future? And we do. Yep, we do. And I'd be loved, I'd, I'd love to discuss this also outside of this space if we can possibly get together and, and have, have a chat about this. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. And we could talk about some details. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I'd like to bring Lauren and Wendy into the conversation. And um, I'm thinking about uh, both of your, your work around navigating cultural differences, trying to break open the kinds of stories that are shared, the kinds of musics that are shared, the kinds of relationships that are built. So we just wonder if you could both talk a little bit each about your projects in terms of what you're seeing in terms of the social, like this question of cultural health. I don't know if that resonates with you, Wendy. Um, and then, uh, Lauren, what you see is, I know it's kind of potential, but you know what you see there. It's, it's quite sad and it's not meant to be an excuse, but I work in a very Anglo area. We have very, you know, um, um, very little, uh, you, part of the, I talked in my presentation about, um, you know, that we have KPM to meet for our Department of Education funding. And, you know, one of those questions, you know, one of them was that we have to be, have early childhood classes. Another area is how many students with language other than English that we teach. We have very few because we have very few in our town. So, um, as I said, I don't want it to sound like an excuse, but a lot of the things that I'm hearing spoken of today are not within the specific community that I work. Um, however, you know, um, what I was going, was going to mention earlier when, you know, the question around the, the economy and the politics and so on, um, you know, the, the whole, and I, I think Catherine might agree with me, once we start to move out into those regional areas, the, the pictures around access and, um, and well-being in those areas possibly are looking, from what I'm hearing in these couple of days, are possibly looking quite different to the spaces that other people are working within. And, um, you know, it, for me, the, the picture is more in our schools and, and, and it's the, the culture of educators that need the work, as Margaret was talking about yesterday. You know, it's, um, it's our schools that don't have enough teachers and we certainly have both state and federal investigations into regional education. Um, there are strategies, there is recognition of the things that are needed, but they don't come, you know? So I feel like I'm coming into the picture a little sideways. Um, it, it's, a, it's from a different community setting that, that's quite isolated in itself. So I don't know whether that kind of... Thanks. Um, I guess I can just add a, a comment about cultural well-being and um, the significance of that for people who are arriving um, uh, either in like a forced migration circumstance or people who are, um, you know, um, moving, you know, to Australia. And this is something that came out of a project with Naomi many moons ago, but sometimes all people can bring with them is their culture. And the maintenance of that within their new context can be extremely important. Um, the link that I'm trying to then make is um, not only spaces for that cultural maintenance to take place and um, for structures to be in place to empower that as a well-being tool, but to have that recognised more widely in these bigger structures. So. Um, heritage institutions play a huge role in what our national narrative is. Uh, when you go to a museum, what stories do you see? Uh, or any kind of um, glam institution. Um, what materials can you access? Uh, and what tells the story? You know, um, whether it's a national story or it's, um, you know, the smithereens of um, beautiful culture that we have in this country, but there's a lot of it that's not. Um, available. There's a lot of it that's just glossed over. Um, so I guess that's what that's what I'm after. Is there's that sense of cultural well-being that comes from seeing um, your your culture represented, and that's that goes for um, yeah. As I said, the the super diverse society that we have, increasingly diverse society. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we're coming to a close, but do we have, are there any questions within the room? I see another question online, I think. Thanks. Um, this one is from Rebecca Yarnold. Rebecca, would you like to pop your video and ask yourself? There we go. Oh, almost. <laughs> well, hang on, oh, it's sorry. Like a disco. 
I'm looking very rustic today, so I'm trying to get my if video. Day three, embrace it. <laughs> I keep pressing start video, but it's not working. I'll just we, talk. We can hear you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, my question, sorry, not Lauren. Uh, it's for Wendy. Um, I typed incorrectly in the chat. Wendy, um, with your classes, when you've got children from diverse cultures, like was the child from Mongolia, the, the beautiful child in the photo, would you consider introducing folk songs from different cultures that represent the children in the classes so that the families can really resonate and relate, but also the classmates can learn and engage in music from other cultures? That's such a beautiful idea and, and it's, it's certainly something that we would love to do. Um, accessing that from the family authentically is, is possibly a little, a little issue. Um, at this, at this point, our communication with them is fairly limited. Um, mum, perhaps, we, perhaps that's a great idea. Perhaps we could get something from mum who does have um, greater communication with us. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a lovely idea, Rebecca. That's certainly something that would be, I can imagine the other children would, and their parents would get so much from that. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you. Um, I think we're at time, so um, hold your applause for a second. I just, uh, just so you know, our next move, it, those of us that are here in the room together, we get to have another delicious lunch. But, but grab your food quickly because in 15 minutes, we're going to go into the foyer here, I think, right? The foyer, and there's going to be um, a beautiful concert for us by the, by the students here in the um, conservatorium. So uh, grab your food. Those of you who are online, I hope you also get to nourish yourself and nourish your soul with some music making or some music listening. And we are coming back together um, in an hour and a half. Um, thank you to, my, to, to these wonderful speakers, researchers, and thinkers. Thank you, Uncle Kev, for joining us online.